Taraki. I'm an MPP1 student here at the Kennedy School. I'm also a member of the Center for Public Leadership Student Advisory Board. Today we are very glad to have Senator Coleman here with us today. Uh, he is visiting as a uh, IOP fellow and I'm, I'm pleased to introduce him today. For over 30 years, Senator Coleman has worked in various levels of government uh, serving the American people. He started first as Minnesota's uh, Chief Prosecutor and Solicitor General, then was elected the Mayor of the City of St. Paul, and most recently served in the U.S. Senate. During his career, he developed a reputation as one who worked across party lines to get things done. And in all he's done, whether it be championing energy legislation, uh, increasing government accountability, or transforming the city of St. Paul, he's shown that serving the, the, the public is not just his career, but at the core of who he is. Senator, uh, we are so glad to have you today. P please join me in welcoming him. To uh, start off the top, uh, to start off the discussion, I wanted to focus uh, primarily on this notion of public leadership and uh, the, the various roles that you've, you've done that in your career, and then we'll take questions from the audience uh, after that. And so just uh, to start off, can you tell me a little bit about your early life and how you, uh, some of the influences, influencers that got you uh, interested in public life? Uh, well, first let me say that uh, mo my life, most of my life has been public service, and I say that with great pride. One of the things that's very frustrating to me is there's so much cynicism out there today in the media about politicians and those folks who were involved in public service. And in part, some of it uh, is our own fault because of the sins of, of the bad actors. You know, the big stories, you know, $90,000 in cash in a freezer. Uh, and, and everyone gets tainted, you know, the Duke Cunninghams or the Jeffersons. Uh, but I do want to say up front that uh, having served in the, in the U.S. Senate, that my colleagues on both sides are, are, are far, they're extraordinary people, extraordinary people who have, uh, in the quiet moments, uh, when, the, when the cameras aren't on, uh, they're not talking about, you know, putting money in their pocket. Uh, they're not talking about personal gain. Uh, they're, all, they're even not always talking about the next election. They're really, the quiet conversations are, uh, being humbled by having the opportunity that we have. Uh, there, there's a lot of prayer that goes on in the Senate. I'll be very upfront. A lot of folks pray a lot for, for wisdom. Uh, and, uh, and a sense of how do we make this better? How do we make it work? Knowing that somebody on the other side has a perspective that's different than mine, and they're heartfelt in theirs, and I'm heartfelt in mine. So I just want to kind of say that up front. Uh, uh, my own path. Uh, I don't know if, you know, I'm sure you study leadership, and I, by the way, I find this fascinating, the study of leadership. On my own, I try to understand, how did I get to where I'm at? Uh, and, and, is, and, and how can I help others kind of get to that place, to be able to be in a position where they can make a difference uh, in the lives of those around them? Uh, is it something you can teach? How much of it are, are you born with? I, I got elected, I was in, in sixth grade, I was treasurer of my class, I, I was, uh, sixth grade. I, uh, by the way, the reason I got elected because my sister was in eighth grade and she was the most popular kid in the school. And so I <laughs> literally came in on her coattails. And, and I was a uh, leader in student government in high school. I was president of my university, a student body at, at Hofstra University. I was also head of the anti war uh, committee at that time. I was a, a student activist. I was president of my class at the University of Iowa Law School in, in Iowa. Each of the colleges, law, medicine, dental, liberal arts, they elect a president of the presidents, and I got elected that. Uh, I served in the Attorney General's office, by the way, didn't run for office for 17 years to get elected. I, so I did not, not, and I hear I'm running for office, but I did public service. But I've always been somebody to say, you know, coach, give me the ball. I, I, I want to I move this forward, and, and then let's kind of bring folks together to get things done. It isn't about me. I can't do it by myself. One of my favorite expression is a leader without followers is a guy taking a walk. <laughs> Think about it. You're, you're nothing special. You can't do anything unless you have the ability to bring others around you. That's my, my belief in order then to accomplish something. And so it is that ability to do that. Long answer to a short question, but I, I do want to add to your recommended reading because I, I suspect it's not in your course reading list, but the July 29th edition of Sporting News and the July 29th edition of Sporting News lists the 50 greatest <coughs> coaches of all time. And, and in that listing, uh, number one, by the way, is John Wooden. 
from UCLA. Number two is Vince Lombardi, one of my favorites. But in that listing, they have anecdotes, stories fr from athletes who worked, served under these coaches, each kind of giving a reflection of their leadership. And as I read that, I realized that in, in so many things that I talked about to folks with whom I was, I, I took that stuff. I must have read it somewhere. It must have been stuck in the back of my head. You know, John Wooden's thing was to tell his team, uh, it, I don't, he's, he's never worried about what the other team's going to do if we do what we do well. I don't care what the others do. We do what we do well. Well, Vince Lombardi is my absolute favorite. He said, gentlemen, he, said, he, would say, he said, gentlemen, or just guys playing football, uh, gentlemen, we are going to relentlessly pursue perfection, knowing full well that we will never achieve it, be, never catch it, never catch it, because nothing is, per is, is perfect. But along the way, we will catch excellence. And then he said, and I have absolutely no remote interest in just being good. So what does it take to inspire for, for one person to lead 11 players of the highest caliber as professionals and to somehow get more out of them, get them to, to, to give the, the maximum plus than somebody else with the same quality of 11 folks? And so I, I add that to your reading list, and you might garner some insight. But bottom line is uh, I have, in my, my life, been involved in service. Uh, in, and I say in a humble way, and maybe that this is what the good Lord wants you to do. I don't know if you can talk about that here. But it may be. Maybe that this is my calling. And I say that humbly. I, I said I say that I, I know that uh, you know, Bill Maher, or Letterman, or somebody would make a joke about it. Listen, Coleman thinks that God told him to do this. But I do think that there may be something that says this is what you're about. And then the challenge is how much of that can you develop and how much of that can you pass on to others? Great, thank you. Uh, you've, you've been recognized uh, in the 90s as, as really one of the handful of great mayors who were able to do a lot of great things. Can you talk a little bit about the, the conditions facing St. Paul prior to you running and what, what led you to run for that seat and, and the, the, the dynamics behind the, your decision? Uh, I was working, by the way, the Conference of Mayors are here, and one of the reasons that I chose this week to participate in Harvard with the, uh, the IOP Fellowship was because I wanted to be here when the Conference of Mayors was here. So I wanted to meet the new mayors. I'm always looking for, for a new talent who's out there with new ideas, and I'm always kind of interested. I think this would be a great place. And I was here 16 years ago. 16 years ago, I participated in this program. I was elected at a time that uh, Rudy Giuliani was elected. I think Bill Rendell, I think Rend Ed Rendell from Philly was elected. Uh, it was a time that American cities, the, the literature, the academic literature was talking about the death of the urban center. People were talking about suburban flight. People were leaving the city, fleeing to the suburbs. Uh, cities becoming places a few haves and many have nots. And, and I was, there's, a, I, there's this theory of the process of spontaneous discovery, the penicillin vaccine being invented in three places around the world at the same time. Uh, in American, urban, American politics and in dealing with kind of urban settings, at a time that the cities were really falling apart, the city of St. Paul from 1989 to 1993 lost half the value of its taxable property. The value of taxable property in downtown St. Paul in 1989 was about $750 million. In 1993, under $350 million. Largest employer had left. I mean, you could see the, the decline of the American city. And so for me, I had, was working the attorney generals. I thought I could make a difference. And I was not pol that politically active. Uh, I was not an activist in the Democrat Party, which controlled St. Paul. I actually got elected the way I got elected. Uh, is I spent almost three years meeting every day, just about breakfast to lunch, somebody, a leader in St. Paul, business leader, community activist, for all close to, to three years, trying to understand what the city needed and, and then developing a vision that I could sell to others as to what the change I could make. Just to just interject, so would you say that prior, uh, I mean, this might be obvious, but for three years going in, you knew, you knew three years ahead that this is the seat you wanted to go for and this is what you wanted to do. Well, the, your the, 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 there was a little, the, the interim piece to that was in, that we had a long-term mayor in St. Paul, a great mayor, very successful mayor. His name was George Latimer. He was going to leave off, he said he was leaving after 13 years. Okay. I was in the Attorney General's office and I, it may sound strange, I thought, you know something, I could do this. 
I could do this. I was the assistant to the Attorney General. I was, I was there writing the speeches, doing the advance work. I was writing the policy. And I thought, I could actually do this, and there's an opening. But the problem was I wasn't tied to the insides of the party. And so I actually got together with a few friends and said, you know, so I'm going to run for mayor. Uh, and the only way I could run for mayor was to block an endorsement and figure I could get to a primary and if I could sell my vision to the, but it was a very narrow vision, I have to tell you. Well, I wasn't successful. It was a less than a 100-day effort. Uh, I actually did block the endorsement of the last ballot and my plan was going great and then all the party faithful kind of got together and the other folks that were in the race all banded together to support one candidate. So I couldn't block the endorsement. And at that point, I just stepped back and then I spent three years saying, okay, I, I, I can do this. And, and, and I realized I had to have a better vision. I had to know more. I had to be clear as to what I wanted to accomplish. And so I spent, it, it, it was not an overnight thing. I, I spent two years working and then the last year selling the vision. And then ultimately, Matt, I became the candidate of the business community. The city was, the, the city was in such poor shape that the the, the newspaper in St. Paul, Pioneer Press, was running articles about what we need in the next mayor, but the present mayor is still there saying he's not going anywhere. So he was dying. And so uh, the business community stepped up, and they entered. there were 13 of us running against the incumbent. The incumbent drops out. The business community, I'll be very candid, they kind of anointed me. And so I ran in as the candidate of the business community against the party. And so in the end, everybody in St. Paul was at that point a Democrat. Uh, it was a conservative Democrat myself against a liberal Democrat. And I got elected as a Democrat, switched parties in 96 based on everything I was doing was what a Republican would do. Uh, I would say with no, no effect, uh, uh, what I believed at that point in time, the best mayors in America were either Republicans like Rudy Giuliani and, and, and the Reardon in L.A. or Democrats who governed like Republicans. And I'd say that to my friend Rich Daly, and perhaps even Rendell at that time. That meant taking on the unions. If you wanted to merge, consolidate units of government, it, it meant challenging the teachers' union so that you could start charter schools. First charter school in America was in St. Paul. I did 20 of them. Uh, it, uh, you know, that, that's, that's the way Daly governed in Rendell. So uh, that was my path, uh, to work hard, lay out a vision, sell it to folks, and then get enough support to enable me to run and beat a, a party that really dominated politics forever in that city. Okay, thank you. Now let's uh, tr tr transition over to uh, your decision to run for, for the Senate. I know in 2002 you, you won a very hard-fought race uh, against, uh, you were running against Senator Wallstone and uh, of course the, the tragic accident. And can you talk about what was going through your mind during those 10 days when you Know, at one moment was, was facing one opponent, and then the next day you find out that you're taking on a former vice president. Well, first, the, uh, for those who didn't, I know there are a lot of international folks here from all over the world, so I don't know how close, closely you followed politics in 2002. I was running against Paul Wellstone. It was a pretty hard-fought race. We believed we were going to win. Uh, we thought the, our, inter our polling showed that Wellstone's reelect on the day he died was like 41%. We thought folks were ready for change. Paul was a, 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 an extraordinarily integrate man. He was very, very liberal and perhaps we believe too liberal for even Minnesota. Uh, but it was a very tough race. And then he died in a plane crash. He, we were up in, we were heading to a debate in Duluth in northern Minnesota. He was in one town. We were in the same kind of plane, 20-something uh, miles away in the same condition. All of a sudden, the news comes that he's died in a plane crash. And, I mean, that was a moment of incredible sadness for everybody. We, every, we just stopped campaigning. But there was an election. It was Friday. In 10 days, it was with the folks were going to choose a new senator. Uh, and the uh, Democrat Party nominated Walter Mondale, who would have been elected had there not been a funeral service that turned into a rally. It, that was that, uh, so at the time he was elected, I, I, that he was nominated uh, in, in we're think, first of all, we had stopped campaigning. We were going to only campaign after the funeral service, so there was going to be about a four or five day campaign. Uh, but I'll be candid and say that I don't, had there not been that, that rally, I don't think I could have beaten Walter Mondale carrying the memory of Paul Wellstone. And, it was, and, and, uh, and at one point, I kind of look back and say, okay, God, you know, Lord, maybe you don't want me to win this. Maybe you want someone else to serve there. That's your, I, I mean, you do what you can do, but it just, and then all of a sudden, this rally transformed it. And, and uh, everything turned around. 
And, you know, a couple days later, I get a call at 8.30 in the morning from the vice president conceding, because uh, it went through the night, uh, and telling me that being in the Senate will be the greatest job I'll ever have. So there are things that you control and things you don't control, but there's one other observation. It was the most liberating time of the campaign. And when I say that, uh, one moment that, that, that kind of encapsulized it and kind of freed you as a candidate. Uh, so much of campaigns today are, are dominated by your consultants and your advisors. And there's always that tension between how much you do yourself, and you say, okay, I think we should do this, versus the experience of folks who have done it many times in many places. Uh, well, when Paul died, the day he died, we fly back. I come back to my house. My family's there. Mom and dad are in town. The you know, son's running for the Senate. Uh, Paul, Paul died, his wife died, a child died, a, a friend of mine, the son of a friend who was, who was an aide of his, who, who I knew the family well. For, I mean, even in politics, you have relationships uh, that cross party lines. Uh, so we're in the house, and, and reporters come outside the front door, line up, they want to comment from me. My campaign advisors are trying to sort this out. I mean, there is an election, though that's their job is, what do, you know, what do you do? We're not thinking about that. My wife was on the plane with me, we you been know, in prayer. Uh, and I remember the reporters going outside, and I was going to walk outside to address them. And I, I'm talking to my campaign staff, and they're saying, don't go outside, do not say anything. In other words, they were going to draft this statement. They were so worried that if you say the wrong thing, and I'm walking to the front door, and they're literally kind of yelling at me, don't walk, don't do, you know, don't do anything unscripted. And, and I said, my wife said, we're going outside just to, express what's in our heart. And I said, you know, I said, folks, I appreciate the counsel. Uh, we'll talk another day. And I walked outside and addressed the press and talked about the sadness we all felt and condolences to the family. And, just, and I can tell you from the rest of the campaign, those last 10 days, I, I, I didn't have to listen to my advisors. I didn't have to. It wasn't the consultants didn't run the campaign. That was actually pretty liberating. It was do what you think is right, do what you think is from the heart, and that's it. And then whatever happens, happens. Uh, the, the uh, you know, it's, I'm remembered the Minnesota Twins won the World Series in 1991. Uh, Jack Morris was the pitcher. He was pitching nine innings. You know, baseball, those who watch baseball, pitchers don't pitch nine innings in, in this day and age. Uh, it, the game is tied. It's going into the 10th inning. And uh, the coach, Tom Kelly, is kind of looking and sends his assistant coach over to Morris and says, tell Morris we're sitting him down, we're bringing somebody in. And Morris tells the coach, tell, tell Kelly I'm going out on the mound. I'm pitching this thing. And Kelly's comment, as I understood it, was, well, as the coach came back and said, hey, he's planned to go out there. And, and Kelly said, oh, it's only a game. <laughs> uh, it's only an election. Life goes on. Mm. And so in the end, li somewhat liberated able to do what you thought was right, and, and, and then I won by about 47,000 votes. Okay. And, and once you got into the Senate, uh, I know every year when, uh, every four years when uh, folks run for president, a lot of them, especially this past year, uh, were senators. And one of the criticisms that comes up is that they lack executive or administrative ex experience. Uh, I know a lot of your colleagues ran. Uh, how important was it to you, or how much of an advantage was it to you that you had come in with eight years of executive experience as a mayor. And I know I ask this because even today, the majority of legislators in the Senate are not, they do not have that. Only 10% of them have ever been mayors before. I don't think the, if I may rephrase the question, since I have a floor, I can do that. Of course. Uh, I don't think the issue is how important was it to me. I would rephrase the matter in terms of how important is it to the country. Exactly. Uh, and, and that I, I truly believe that uh, the country would be better served if there were more former mayors in the Senate. And the reason being is that mayors are kind of life, our experience is focused on solving the problem and getting things done. Uh, and also, by the way, at, at, at having at times to put ideology behind you. You know, there, there isn't a Democrat or Republican way to plow the streets. You just you plow the streets. Uh, and by the way, in St. Paul, Minnesota, if it snows and the streets are not plowed the next day, you hear about it, okay? <laughs> there's, no, there's no hiding. As the mayor, you're at the bottom of the political food chain. You're in contact with your constituents every day, you know, because you're there. You're not in Washington, you're right there. 
And so I think the, the mayors with whom I worked tended to be uh, more pragmatic. So it wasn't just about leadership style, but it was about the reality of what it took to be effective in the job and then bringing that to a deliberative body, a legislative body, that at times I I you can debate things forever. But mayors bring a mindset of actually fixing it. Yeah. And I'm a believer that that people want us to fix things the right way, but we're there, we're, it's public service is a customer service business. I'm in the customer service business. When I was mayor of St. Paul, uh, in my license in Bureau, I had to put up a big sign behind a big banner, probably half the size of these shades. It was really pretty big, and it said customer service. And I had him put that sign up, not to remind, not, not for the folks coming in to see, but for the employees every day to look at to be reminded of this is what this is the business we're in. I want people to take out licenses to fix up their business in their homes. It means they're investing in my city. So I think the the mindset of solving something makes it much more likely that you're going to reach across the aisle to to get something done. Bring your own principle to the table. But if you look at the at the Lugers and you know I'll uh, speaking candidly, I'll, I'll choose Diane Feinstein over Barbara Boxer any day. I really will. One is more inclined to kind of work in a bipartisan way, and the other tends to be more dogmatic. The former mayor, Feinstein, tends to be yeah. more practical, more pragmatic. And I think that's a quality that I wish there were more of in the world's greatest deliberative body. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask one more question before uh, we open it up to the floor. Uh, a lot of folks in this room and here at the Kennedy School are interested in pursuing public office. And as one who's uh, spent uh, his career running in different campaigns, I know you've had some very interesting and uh, yet formidable uh, opponents. You know, I don't know if ever in history we're going to find another person who's run against former vice president, former wrestler, former comedian. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> uh, it's very, very interesting, isn't it? Uh, but what? What practical advice would you give to the folks here in this room uh, who are interested in, in this, uh, this vocation? Well, first, there isn't, and this is obvious, there isn't a single path. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think I would hope that uh, folks involved in small business would get involved in politics more. But by the way, that's hard. A sister and brother-in-law have been involved in retail business for years. They work really hard. They don't really have time to do much politics. They, they, their interest, they, they watch their brother. My sister watches her brother. She's in Jersey. I'm in Minnesota. That's, it's hard because they're spending their time building their business. Uh, there is, I, I think, a decided edge on the other side of the aisle who have folks maybe working in government, who government is their life, who want to be in government. It's a lot easier. Uh, and, and business people, by the way, somehow don't have a, a real clear understanding of what it takes to be in politics. You may be the world's, I've seen a lot of CEOs try to enter the political arena and get devoured. It's very different. And so there isn't a single path. I, I think the key is, is simply to, to be involved, to, to, to have passion, uh, to, to kind of track what's going on. And if you believe you can make a difference, find a way to do that. And there's not, again, a single way to do that. Uh, but I always, I, uh, the, the, uh, there's a Jewish philosopher named Maronides who said, each of us should view ourselves if the world were held in balance and any single act of goodness on our part could tip the scales. And I think it's that mindset, saying, you know something, I think the world's held in balance and my single act of getting involved, maybe in a campaign, licking an envelope, writing a check, knocking on a door, that may tip the scales. Uh, when I got elected to the Senate, I was the 51st Republican. Uh, John Roberts, when he was going before the Senate to be Chief Justice, meets with the Senators. Every Senator gets a vote. It's one of our constitutional obligations, advise and consent on Supreme judges, Supreme Court nominees. And he said to me, he said, Senator Coleman, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be here. Hmm. I thought, what do you mean by that, Judge? Judge, you're going to get my vote. What do you mean by that? I had read his writings. I had consulted, by the way, with my, my old constitutional law professor from the University of Iowa as to what to read and, and, and review. And I graduated law school in 76, but I still stayed in touch. Uh, but his point was, his, he said uh, that when 
uh, he had been nominated by the, pr by the president to be on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. It was 51-49 the other way, and his nomination was held in abeyance. It wasn't going anywhere. It was on the shelf. Uh, and that when I got elected, it switched it over. His nomination came off the shelf. I think it was unanimous current, but he came uh, confirmed to the D.C. Circuit. He would never be in a position to be nominated for Chief Justice had I not been the 51st Republican, and all of a sudden he's now on the Court of Appeals. Okay, I won by 47,000 votes. Those, I could go back to those voters, and if, if you think that's a good thing, as I do, that Robert's on the Supreme Court, you can say that single act of goodness in your part tipped the scales. The world's a different place today. So I think it's that mindset, but without a singular path to say, here's how you're going to become a U.S. senator or a mayor. It's being involved, being concerned, being passionate, and doing, being willing to work hard. Okay, thank you. All right, we're going to open it up to the floor for any questions. I, I know we have a uh, rotating microphone. I know we're short on time, so I ask you to uh, state your name and affiliation and keep your questions uh, short and to the point. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Good morning, Senator. Good morning. See you again. Um, my question is about the spotlight that's on President Obama when it comes to the Afghanistan decision right now. Um, reading the newspapers in the morning, we see uh, opinions that the <coughs> President is either dithering or he's also taking his time and calculating. And I was wondering what advice you would have for us as students as we try to evaluate leadership in such a way uh, when we see both sides of the same exact decision going on um, and how that actually might affect foreign policy. Thank you. Uh, I'm among those who uh, have not been as critical of the president for taking time. Afghanistan is tough. It's really tough. But here's my concern about the decision-making process. And, and decision-making process as it relates to war, as it relates to a situation in which lives are on the line, in which it, sacrifice is going to be made, and, and we're talking the ultimate sacrifice. That's probably the most solemn obligation of, of the president. My concern is uh, when I see uh, a leaked out to the press, on the one hand you have the general's recommendation, and all of a sudden you see the, the contrary recommendation of the ambassador who used to be a general. And then all of a sudden, and that, those things get leaked for a reason. It's the, it, it provides cover if you don't go the path of the recommended by your commander on the ground, you've got cover to say, well, look, I had this other recommendation and maybe we compromise. I'm of the mind that, that when it comes to decisions of war, those kind of, it's not about compromise. This is not, it should not be a political decision. Uh, there was a piece in Huffington Post just a couple of days ago that's, uh, that said the you know, political class has lost faith in, in Afghanistan, lo they lo they lost the commitment. Well, now you, you're going to find yourself involved in a political decision, but people's lives are on the line. American security is on the line, and so I worry about that. Take a look to see at what the decision, and is it phrased in terms of compromise for the sake of politics? I think there are some decisions that that, that have to be, in, in, I believe in war, you set your strategic objective, you identify it, you put it on out there, and then you give all the resources you can to achieve it. Uh, and, uh, and so I'm, a little, I'm troubled by the politics now of Afghanistan. I, I'll speak very candidly here. I think it was behoove some uh, who opposed the war in Iraq to somehow tell the American public that, well, they weren't weak on security, uh, it was just the wrong war. And Afghanistan was the right war. And now we're involved in Afghanistan, which is really difficult. I think more difficult than Iraq. And now all of a sudden, folks are saying, well, we really didn't mean that. And so I, I just worry about the politics of the decision. I'm not as troubled by the, the, the time to make the right decision, but I would hope decisions that involve putting uh, folks, men and women at risk, lives on the line for the ultimate sacrifice that they're made with a strategic objective, and then there's a commitment to achieve that objective. Thank you. Yep. All right, just like back here to Joel. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd just like to ask a question about your views on the future of the Republican Party at the moment. You've talked a lot about pragmatism, um, and yet we're seeing in New York 23rd and elsewhere a kind of retrenchment, uh, and I'm wondering what your feelings are about that and whether you're, whether you're hopeful or not. Actually, I'm extraordinarily hopeful because of the results from the last election. Uh, and, and in particular, and I'll, t I'll address uh, New Jersey, Virginia, and New York. If you look at, at uh, Virginia, 
in Virginia. And when I say hopeful, I'm hopeful that the Republican Party can uh, reach out, uh, can go beyond a narrow conservative base. I, I believe, and this was my presentation at the forum the other day, that America is, and, I, and, and statistically I can show you that, show you all the polling, is a center-right nation. That's where America is at. And that the key to success are independents, and Americans are more conservative than they are liberal. And all the polling I, I've seen, about 40% of people identify, 35, 40 can identify themselves as conservative, and only 20-something is liberal. And independents then tend to be center-right, not far-right. But they tend to be center-right, and, and, and the Republican Party should be able to appeal to them. If given a choice, I firmly believe if I lined up 10 folks from Massachusetts, 10 folks from Minnesota, 10 folks from Texas, 7 of the 10, 7 of the 10 from Massachusetts, Minnesota, would say, I don't want the government to run General Motors. It doesn't make sense to me. That's what I believe, and I think data confirms that. If you look at the New Jersey, at the, at the Virginia race, you had a, a very hardcore doctrinaire conservative candidate who, won, crushed the Democrat among independents because he ran not as a doctrinaire conservative, he ran as a center-right conservative, pragmatic. We're going to deal with transportation. We're going to deal with unemployment. We're going to deal with jobs and, and without raising taxes, more spending, et cetera. He didn't run to a, his, a, a again, this is a, a McDonald's, a pretty strong, cons I mean, conservative. He didn't run that, that type of race. He ran appealing, as, it was a center-right campaign, and he crushed the Democrat among independents. And in New Jersey, which is an overwhelming blue state, for Republicans it always breaks our heart because we always think we're going to win New Jersey, never do. Uh, and in New Jersey, you had a candidate, again, who ran the same kind of campaign, and the difference was independence. He crushed the, the Democrat among independents. That's how he ended up winning by a pretty substantial margin. And in New York 23, I, I think the, the lesson in New York 23 uh, is, is that if you, and they had a good doctrinaire conservative candidate, ran that campaign, ultimately didn't win. Didn't win. So I think the message is if we want to win, that we have to reach out to the broader public, that it's not enough just to, uh, to, to appeal to a hardcore conservative base, that, that what I call center-right, and, and the calm things that unite Republicans on, on lower taxes and, and more limited government, but still government, not anti-government. Not anti-government. Government plays a role in people's lives, but it can do it a, a cost-effectively. It can do it focused. It can do it in, in a way that lifts people up, but with wise use of tax dollars. So I think the the experience of the last cycle is actually the most uplifting for somebody like me. Our challenge is to take advantage of it. And, and, and I'll just, one last thought. Long, I know the answers are much too long, but I served in the Senate, not the House. See, in the House, you get two minutes. In the Senate, you can speak forever. Uh, uh, the, the, my, my, here's my fear. I actually, there is a lot of anger out there today. And by the way, it's not anger just from the radical right. The, the American public, those, those town hall forums are, are expressions of real anger and, and Politicians would be foolish to disregard that. There's, there's concern out there. Uh, and that anger actually may produce some turnabout, uh, in, for instance, in House races that could have a significant impact. My fear is that if we run and win on anger, that in the end we're not going to be able to govern from center right, and we will take one step forward and not produce and take two steps back. And so I think th there are columnists. I think Fred Barnes has said, Republicans don't need to offer anything, just let the Democrats do what they're doing and, and you can win. I disagree. I think we have to articulate, here's where we're at on health care, here's where we're at on, in, on increasing, raising the, uh, growing the economy. And it's not, you don't grow the economy simply by spending more money. There's a series of things that we're for. Here's what we're for on national security. And I think if we do that, I think we have a chance to, to make substantial gain and I think the lessons of the last couple of weeks are actually uplifting. Good morning. As the Republican Party works to define a strategy for 2012, what role do you see Sarah Palin in as best serving the Republican Party and the American people? First, let, let, me, let me say um, I'm not in a position to give Sarah Palin a lot of advice. Uh, she is a force in the Republican Party. She is a force. I can tell you that my colleague Saxby Chambliss, who was forced into a runoff, after the last election, 
Uh, he will tell you that when Sarah Palin came to Georgia, she had a greater impact and mobilized more people, generate, raised more money than anybody else. I would say, from my own perspective, if our party is to be uh, effective, we've got to go beyond Sarah Palin, beyond, what, beyond the reach that she has. But I don't discount the reach and the energy and everything that she has. She is a force. I think to be effective in Massachusetts and effective in New York and effective in Minnesota, you have to go beyond that. But, but I give her credit for being a mobilizing force for a part of the party. There needs to be greater outreach if we're to be a majority party. We got to, she appeals, I, I think it's fair to say, to a lot of the passion. I think there's got to be, a, 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 in addition, a more thoughtful kind of outreach. So give her credit for what she can do, for what she attracts. I don't discount from that. I think you've got to, got to be more. That's one person's opinion. In the back. As chairman of the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, you investigated the uh, UN Oil for Food Program. Please tell us something about it, because it exposed corruption around the world in many countries. And I come from India, where the External Affairs Minister had to resign, right. which was an unprecedented event, which we didn't think you know would happen. So I think many people here would like to hear about it. It's interesting, be because one of the frustrations that a lot of folks have, they say, well, Senator, you did that investigation. You, you looked at how Saddam manipulated oil for food programs so that every trade, that, that was a program that was designed to uh, help the Iraqi people in the face of sanctions to allow them to get access to food and medicine and use oil as payment in return. So it was a humanitarian program. And Saddam manipulated so that on every single trade, did two things, on every single transaction, he got a, a take. And, and, and there were folks then who were complicit in that. And part of the complicity was to, for, for their own benefit. Uh, and and in, in India was an example where folks they actually moved on that. I truly believe, and I'll say this up front, I truly believe that Saddam, Saddam believed that he had bought the United Nations. He believed that he had bought the United, that they would never act against him, never act against him because he owned them through, we're talking about billions of dollars in oil for food. And I think that's a shame. I think that's a shame. The, the other part of it is it also then raised all sorts of other issues from an American perspective about the United States taxpayers putting about $4 billion in, a year into the United Nations when you look at all the programs, including, including the voluntary ones. A and there not being the kind of transparency and accountability that one should expect. I am uh, the uh, in, in St. Paul, Kofi Annan went to McAllister College uh, and had a lot of followers there. And, and I can tell you, I was attacked by the, uh, the largest newspaper in the state for simply calling into question Kofi's leadership. Uh, and I forget the word they used, but, but it, it was, uh, they, whether they said it was disgusting that I was doing that, but he, his leadership and the people that he had under him run the program, the folks in it were clearly corrupt. How far it went, we'll never know. Kofi never unveiled his personal finance. When Ban Ki-moon came in to, as Secretary General, the first thing he did is he made public disclosure of all his finances. Uh, there were real concerns about the benefits Kofi's son had from some of these transactions. And, and so I thought it was a very legitimate, very appropriate for, an Ameri for a United States senator to question and, and push the UN about transparency and accountability. And, and we've made some progress, not enough. But we clearly made progress. And around the world, there were actions that were taken. And that is somewhat satisfying. But I have no doubt that Saddam Hussein believed in his mind that he had bought the United Nations, that they would never move against him. And he used the program, the humanitarian program, to accomplish that. And he made, he made a lot of billions. Others made millions. And the Iraqi people suffered. Tim here in the third row has had his hand up for a while. Hi, thanks so much for being here. My, my name is Tim Leiden and I'm MPP1. Um, I just wanted to address a, a topic that I think cuts across, like public leadership across branches, sectors, and, par and parties within, within the United States. 
which is the interaction of the press, uh, the interaction of, of public servants with the press. And uh, how has, is your experience both as a mayor and then as a senator, how do you work to lead and not be led or confined by the 24-hour news cycle, which is probably more of an issue in the Senate? But I mean, even as a mayor, I'm sure you had a lot of uh, interaction with the press that, 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 that perhaps challenge your ability to lead in the way you wanted to. So I was just curious your thoughts on that. That, that, that t subject, Matt, that issue is one of the most important things that is discussed with the new mayors. Uh, you, you, uh, relations, how do you deal with the press? And it is challenging, and it's, it is more challenging today because of the nature of the media with technology. And here is, here is the challenge, and this is both as a leader, also as a candidate. So, you, the, so the basic issue is, is, is working with the press. They're right there. The difference between, that's why I talked about the difference between some corporate figures who want to run for office, uh, and they don't realize that there's a reporter sitting outside there for everything they do. They're used to operating and, and making command and control decisions. Uh, vision and the result, you never get there. So just understanding that difference, that the nature of the media is, is, is to generate and, and to highlight strife and discord and controversy. I'll add another element to it that, that is the most disturbing today, and it probably it perhaps impacts more the, on the election side, but still it's the same. And that is with the, uh, with the internet, with blogs, there are no filters anymore. So what happens in campaigns is an operative on the other side comes up with a, uh, a, a, a story or rumor about you, a candidate, a public official, you know, Norm Coleman is a wife beater. A and you print, and, and what you do is you try to feed that to reporter. Well, in the old days, two years ago, the <laughs> old days, you could actually sit with an editor and tell the editor, say to the editor, you can't print that story first. It's not true. You have nothing to confirm it. It's simply the kind of garbage that goes on in, 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 in politics today. And quite often, the editor or the publisher would say, you're right. They would have a standard. There's no standard state. There's no filter. You know, I love, what's the, uh, what's the line? Michael Scott in the office, he says, uh, he really, he loves Wikipedia. He says, you, you, you know you, he says, you know you're getting the best information because anybody can say anything they want. <laughs> okay? There's no filter. So today, an operative feeds something to report at the same time he feeds it to a blogger. The blogger who have, you know, sitting there in, the, in their basement of their mother's home, Never, <laughs> never seeing fresh air, you know, eating marshmallows, okay, but now has some sense of self-worth because they're bridging something that somebody's actually looking at, uh, and the blogger prints it, and then the reporter goes back and prints what was printed on the blog, as seen on the blog. There are no filters. And in a 24-7 media environment, folks are always looking for and copy, and campaign operatives know it, opposition knows it, and in a world, last comment, in a world where newspapers are dying, Pineapple, the St. Paul Star Tribune is bankrupt. You know, Boston, I mean, across the, the country, other than the Wall Street Journal, which I read on Kindle every day. Okay? Uh, they're, they're, you've got a, the sensational cells. So you see in the paper all these columns now seen in a blog. They're printing garbage without filter and filling content in order to try to stay alive. Not very good for the system. Not very good for the body politic. Challenging to folks in public office. More challenging today than ever before. All right, we'll end with uh, two quick questions. In the front, please. Yeah, you can go ahead and speak up. Can you hear in the back, by the way? OK, good. All right. learned we should have done a better job getting our absentee ballots counted. And I'll, I'll speak in candor. We got more votes election night. We got more votes when the machines were tallied. Uh, I firmly believe that the votes that are on count, so the other side got more votes counted, absentee ballots counted in the process. The bulk of votes we wanted counted, we never got counted. And not because they were any different from votes that were counted. The Supreme Court ultimately d ruled that the fact that there were different standards between way votes were, were, were viewed in Minneapolis versus Carver County, Minneapolis 
70% Democrat, Carver County, 70% Republican, uh, is, did not violate the Constitution. But those votes in Carver, because the judges in, were not uh, being discriminatory when they made their judgments. Simply one set in, in, in Minneapolis, by way of example, uh, if there is an absentee ballot, and on the ballot, the, the, the witness, there's a name of a witness here, and if the witness wasn't registered, in Carver County, there were 181 of those votes Regular ballot, the one problem is witness not registered. They were held out, rejected. It was Carver County, they checked to see if witness was registered. In Minneapolis, by the way, we said 17, over 17,000 absentee ballots, five or more than five times what Carver County had, much more. Uh, not a single ballot was rejected for that reason. There should have been hundreds of absent of witnesses not registered, but they chose, they didn't reject any for that reason. Neither did St. Paul or Duluth. A and so, in, in the end, we didn't get our votes counted. We didn't meet our burden of proof, do what had to be done. Uh, and yet, at, I also made a decision after the Supreme Court ruled that, that was it. Could you brought it to the Supreme Court? Yes, it could. I think you reach a point where you have to move on, where we needed to simply say this election is over. But, uh, but I will say very, uh, you know, up front that our side has to do a better job on trying to ensure equality at the way absentee ballots are viewed. Otherwise, folks from conservative areas are going to be a disadvantage because the judges there in those areas tended to follow what they saw as the letter of the law and held back hundreds of more ballots than folks in other areas who, uh, uh, and, and again, not in his intent to discriminate, but their worldview is, you know something, get the, let the votes in. This is a Minnesota address. He's a real, we think he's a real person. Count the vote. And, and so I, I, I think hopefully we'll learn lessons uh, of that, and particularly, and usually you don't worry about these because races aren't that close. But when they are close, all of a sudden you take a look and you say, hey, different standards based on where you live. Our whole theory was that whether your vote counted shouldn't depend on where you live. In the end, whether your vote was counted did depend on where you live, but it didn't cross any constitutional line. And so we've moved on. It is what it is. I hope in the next election that there's more uniformity. Otherwise, somebody's going to be at a disadvantage. And, and with more and more people voting early and absentee, it should be like the night of the election where there's one standard. You, you know, everyone can, the ballot's counted one way. That's not the reality with absentee votes. There's not one standard, and I think that is still problematic. Right. We have time for one last quick question. It would be the uh, best question of the night. Right no pressure on you or anything. <laughs> I just wanted to follow up on that question uh, very quickly. Um, and uh, the, you mentioned the, Cal the, the 23rd district in New York, and the, the candidate there, the conservative candidate, came out a few days ago and said he might be willing to unconcede given how some um, absentee ballots are, ballots are counted. I was wondering how you advise the candidate, given that a, a congressman has been seated, and how you would balance and advise him that he balance attention between making sure the votes are counted and getting on and governing. I don't know enough about the numbers in that. I, I'm going to tell you from, you know, my sense is you don't, don't unconcede if that's, I, if you've got the result there. And I don't, I don't think it was as close uh, as one might want in order to be impacted by absentee ballots. But I would tell you, had New Jersey been close, had New Jersey been close, I would have gone to New Jersey. And I would have advised Christie about how to deal with the next, the, the process. I can tell you in Minnesota that the other side came in. They had a case management system better than ours. They had learned lessons from the Washington State case. In fact, it was the same team that did the Washington State case, where Rossi, the Republican, was head of Gregoire, like the first count, the second count, and ultimately loses. I don't know whether the third, fourth, or fifth count. And my advice to, to Christie would have been, this is no longer just your local campaign. Now it's, this is litigation. So don't worry about you know, who, has the, who, who has the local council. Don't worry, you're not looking for more votes from the public. This is litigation. Approach it as litigation. Figure out what, what has to be done to make sure that you're not at a disadvantage when it comes to the process of counting votes that weren't counted election night. And, and, I, and, and so I would have, I would have sat down with, with Christie had it been that close, and it wasn't. But in New York 23, again, not knowing enough about it, uh, I think the process of, of, of unconceding, or say, is, is uh, I think probably should be way past that point. There's always another day in politics. All right, thank you, Senator, so much. I know you've said that uh, you, you've come here to hear from us, but truly we have learned a lot from you this week. So we wanted to thank you, and I wanted to thank each of you for being here.
today. Thank and let you. me just say quickly, I know folks are leaving, but I really have learned. I, this has been a great experience for someone coming in, and uh, I've had a number of sessions trying to, you know, what's on people's minds. Even these questions, appreciate the, the oil for food question. I haven't talked about that for a while, but uh, this, is, uh, th this is a two-way ex uh, experience, and you've really given me a lot, and for that I'm very, very appreciative. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks.